Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Drum Talk, and with me today is Joe from Drum Forge, and we have Kurt Ballou, special guest. Uh, if you don't know who Kurt Ballou is, he has worked with uh, Converge and also God City Studios, um, and you're a founding member of Conver Converge, is that right? I am, yeah. 1991. That's high school crazy. band. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, the band that broke up. So do you find it an interesting, uh, you know, now that you know so much about production um, throughout the years and you've gotten, you know, more uh, in-depth with that, has that affected your approach to the music in Converge in, in terms of, you know, how you write or how you produce? Yeah, for sure. Um, it affects it in a lot of ways. I mean, f just one really... Um, really important example of that is uh, Ben, our drummer, um, I, f I found him through recording bands. You know, he's been in the band since 1999, um, so he's been in the, you know, he's the most long-standing drummer that we've ever had, and, and also, like, the drummer who's played on, um, you know, all my, my the, the Converge records that I'm most proud of, um, but yeah, he was actually in a couple of different bands that I was recording um, prior to him joining the band, so that was my introduction to him, so... And you know, in, in one sense, it's like a recording has been a recruitment tactic for me. Um, but <laughs> but um, in another sense, I was actually doing um, not that long ago this this podcast called um, Song Exploder, um, and the Rishi Kesh, the guy who does that podcast, he's really into with all of his podcasts. He's he's very into trying to understand how the space in which music is written and recorded affects that music. And um, I, I had not really considered this prior to doing this podcast, but my studio, where my band has been practicing for the past um, like twelve years or so, is it's it's pretty dry and neutral sounding in there. It's like it's not really ambient, so it's literally coming, you know, it's like a controlled studio kind of sound. And I think that that's one of the reasons why my band tends to overplay a lot. We play, you know, really fast or mostly fast music where we kind of fill in every little bit of space with a lot of notes. Um, just because, like, slow music that would sound really cool in, in a really ambient space where just, you know, you can just go black em black em black em on the drums and it's like, whoa, it's so explosive and cool. Like, in my studio, it's just like blick em blick em blick em like, no yeah. matter how hard you hit. Right, right. Right, so, like, but you can go like super fast, and that sounds cool in a really dry kind of acoustic space. So I think that, um, you know, aside from my knowledge of production, just like the actual space that we're writing all of our songs in has had like a really huge impact on the course of the band, and that's um, sort of, you know, incidental to my recording, but but directly, uh, you know, responsible from it. Now, I, yeah. I find that very interesting, um, and I wanted to say I know you to be um, pretty big on a hybrid of combining analog and digital approach to drum production, mm -hmm. um, capturing, you know, a good real performance, but then using the digital space to sort of tweak um, those sounds and shape those sonically. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of your mindset behind, um, you know, how those two things work together. Sure. I mean, I, it, real quickly, I would say that I generally tend to favor um, analog stuff for broad brush things and digital stuff for surgical things. Um, and also, um, I tend to do... Well, anytime I know that I'm going to need to automate something, I do it in the computer. So, uh, whereas... Uh, and anything I'm recording, I'm thinking about mixing from the very beginning. You know, when I start tracking drums, I'm thinking about how am I going to mix these drums. And um, I, I tend, tend to use more analog gear in my mixes than would be convenient to set up recalls for. So what I tend to do is when I'm mixing a record, I get all the analog gear kind of set in a way that works well for the entire album. And then I would start working on song by song individually and doing whatever song by song tweaks need to happen in the digital domain. So um, 
that that enables me to work on mixing a whole album all at once. So even though I don't have recalls like several weeks later, at least within a a mix project, let's say it takes four days to mix an album, um, over the course of those four days, I can revisit any any of the songs within that album because the analog gear sort of stays the same, and the digital gear is the stuff that's that's varying. Um, so that enables me to like say like. Uh, a snare is tuned a little differently for a song, or we chose a different snare for a different song. Like, I can EQ that snare a little bit differently in the box, and then keep my kind of broad brush EQ and compression stuff that I'm doing in the in the analog domain. I can keep that fixed. That's that's, that's a really cool approach. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I really admire is, people uh, that are able to... going back. Oh, yeah. Sorry for the delay. That's okay. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, going back to kind of Converge's whole sound on how it's such an aggressive sound, and you bring up that it's such a controlled room, and that's kind of part of that sound. Uh, do, you, do you find yourself uh, coming up with any mixing techniques in terms of, you know, distorting things? I know you we talked earlier, and you you said you use uh, some, you know, harmonic excitement and, and distortion on some of your drums. Does, do you find that adds into... Uh, the sound of you know the drum kit for those productions that you you work on. Yeah, for sure. I definitely add varying levels of of saturation, distortion, harmonic excitement, things like that, um, both to close mics and ambient mics. But it's always a very fine balancing act between um, you know still you know because I don't tend to use drum samples very often, so I'm, I'm I have to be very aware of how adding that stuff to, say, drums affects the cymbals, because a lot of times too much of that kind of stuff, or getting a, getting a drum like really cooking and sounding cool will then will in turn ruin the cymbal sound. Um, so a lot of things happen in, in parallel. There might be some parallel type of saturation, or maybe maybe like, you know, the snare drum I would, you know, maybe run run through like drumatom or something to remove some cymbals, or gate it, or both, and then distort that uh, drumatom gated snare drum and combine it with an un, you know an unprocessed snare um, or maybe it's just like a hair of distortion on that and then um, the snare gets summed and there's a hair of distortion on the group. I, I tend to do a lot of things like a lot of small moves at many stages rather than like one or two big moves at one stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm trying different stuff all the time, but it's, it depends a lot on the drummer. And uh, but the fact that I have a pretty dry room is helpful for that. When I've when I've recorded in like splashier sounding rooms, you know, there's just cymbals and everything. And um, the fact that my room is reasonably dry definitely helps me out and enables me to kind of push drums into the red if I need to um, without completely destroying the cymbal sound. Yeah, nice. and I think I think you bring up a good point, uh, especially about when in your mixing techniques that you uh, are using all these parallel tracks uh, to blend in and just augment into that initial sound that you capture because you've yeah. worked so hard to capture such a great initial sound in that drum room. Uh, you're only looking to further enhance it, and I think a lot of people sometimes think of the fact that oh, I need to have you know 40 different saturation plugins on you know, my snare channel or my kick channel uh, to get it sounding great. So I think that's a really good tip for people. Yeah, it's always a fine kind of kind of balancing act. You know, I'm I'm trying to like, you know, I love the way that drums sound naturally in a room, but unfortunately with a lot of the kind of productions I work on, what drums actually sound like doesn't sound good in the context of the production. So I, I need to find a way to like make drums feel natural and, you know, and sound like what you think drums sound like in the room and not what they actually sound like in the, in the room. And that's really just like, you know, a combination of a ton of little things that all stack up to, you know, to a drum sound. But, you know, the more complicated it gets, the, the more minutia there is to manage and the, the more easily that kind of stuff can fall apart. Um, you know, I find, like, those, those, like, parallel tracks, I find myself doing a lot of automation to them. You know, let's say somebody's just doing like a kind of snare roll, and you've got this like hyper compressed, turbo saturated, like parallel track going with this like really dynamic track. That you know that you need to like then automate your um, 
your parallel track in order to match the dynamics of the of the unprocessed track. You know, think, or or it just kind of falls apart and the, the sense of realism goes away. Um, so it just it's a lot of minutia to manage. Absolutely. And I noticed there was a very interesting technique I wanted to ask you about that I saw you doing on Creative Live, where you put a speaker on a snare drum and you quote unquote reamped the snare. Yeah. Um, and I I'd love for people to sort of check out your Creative Live and, and find out more about that, but can you give us a summary of what that is essentially about? Yeah, basically the idea is that you use the voice call of a speaker to, um, to drive um, an acoustic source. So um, what I do is I take a small um, kind of fast four-inch mid-bass driver and just a raw speaker and stick it on top of the head of a snare drum and then that that speaker sort of fires down into the snare and mostly what it's doing is exciting the snares on the bottom side of the snare and it gets the drum it just gets the drum moving I haven't had as much success with doing it on toms or kick because there's I mean maybe it's just because there's more volume of air within the drum but I think it also has a lot to do with the fact that there's no snares um, on the back sides of like a kick or toms and you know exciting those snares gets the drum going and gets you like you know it doesn't get you like a rim shot level of crack or anything like that but it gets some of the tone of the drum and certainly the snariness so I, I found that to be really useful when for well, a few things that can be really useful for if there's uh, it's it's a first aid technique you know it's not like a go-to technique for me but if um, you know, if somebody sends me like sound replace drums, I want to add a sense of realism to them. I, I can reamp the um, the samples through the real snare, and it'll add a bit of realism and depth and variation that that, that wasn't there. Um, if someone sends me like a really super high tuned or super low tuned drum that just isn't really fitting into the mix, um, and I don't want to use a sample, then um, the reamping technique can be a way to get a different snare sound. Uh, it's especially helpful with like super high tune drums that have no depth. You know, you go out and reamp it with a deep drum, and then you've got like that crack from the original track, and then you've got some depth from your reamp track. And other times, people um, don't don't bottom like a snare. You're just lacking snariness in your mix, um, which is uh, I think important in a lot of things, but especially like in blast beaty kind of stuff. To ha it's important to have a bunch of the bottom snare sound in there. And uh, it can also be something to just give you more snare that's isolated from the cymbals. So you have you have a track of you know of, of snare information that doesn't have any cymbals in it, which is which can be nice to have. It's a great tip, uh, and you know thanks for sharing your your time and your information with us, and and thanks for being on the show. Um, you know if if people were to go and try and find you on the internet, where could they find you? Well, I'm actually on the verge of launching a new site. Uh, it's not up yet, but soon there will be a uh, godcitystudio.com. That's great. And Thanks. also, you guys can catch Kurt on his Creative Live. He has a couple of Creative Live classes on there, um, creativelive.com. And, uh, yeah, thanks again. Cool. Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you so much. All right. See you guys later. See you. See you.